I'm looking forward uh, to our next panel where we're going to discuss um, the difference between uh, academic uh, teaching facilities and teaching institutions, as well as uh, research academic institutions. Um, this was one of the topics that was brought up and requested by many people on Twitter. And we only have one panel on this topic, uh, which I acknowledge is not nearly enough time to adequately uh, discuss this topic in any kind of depth. I want to be really clear on that. Um, but I wanted to at least have one, one panel. Uh, so I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves really quickly. Um, so we're going to do this in alphabetical order, starting with Barney. Uh, so super fast name, you know, two sentences. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm Barney Grubbs. I'm a polymer chemist at Stony Brook University. Before I taught at Stony Brook, I was at Dartmouth College, um, and I'd done different things at big and small colleges earlier on. Thanks. Cecilia. Good morning, everyone. It's here at 30 in, in California, so I'll say good morning. Uh, my name is Cecilia, assistant professor at California State University, Los Angeles, where I teach biochem. Uh, Luna. You're, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm a professor at uh, Purdue University in civil engineering and materials engineering. Before I moved to Purdue, I was a system professor at uh, UNC Charlotte and uh, the Roger William University at Rhode Island, which is a liberal arts primary teaching institution. So I think that probably relevant to this panel, I've been both sides. Hi, my name is Mark Harrison. I'm an assistant professor of electrical engineering at Chapman University, which is a, a private, primarily undergrad teaching institution in Orange County, California. And before this, I uh, worked in industry for a few years before or after I finished my PhD. Great. Um, so I have a couple of questions kind of kick off our conversation and then um, I'm going to open it up to our audience to ask questions. And again, just as a reminder, um, please enter questions and upvote them on Slido. And I have reposted what the password is to get into Slido. Um, okay, so we're going to start uh, with Barney. Um, so what is the biggest difference that you've experienced between a teaching institution and an R1 institution? And then anyone else can follow up with thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that the obvious differences are the are the teaching load at a at a teaching place. You're going to probably have two or three courses a semester at a research university. It's going to depend on the place, but again, you'll have anywhere from zero to to two a semester. Um, there are other differences in terms of class size, but a lot of them are going to really depend on the specific place. I think if uh, Perhaps the other panelists have things to add. I was say, I'm, Cecilia, Mark. I'd like to add, I'm at a comprehensive teaching university, and he is absolutely right. If you are looking for a job at a more public university like mine, like a Cal State system, I, I want to just mention this because I thought the first speaker, Dr. Wirtz, was so right in terms of the publications, but if you are um, wanting to apply at a big CSU, for example, and I say big because we have over 25,000 students, highlight that you are able to mentor and work with undergrads. And so in your publications, play that up because that's what, um, at a teaching institution, those are the things, of course, we want to publish in research. When you highlight that you can work with students, especially undergraduate students, that that just um, mm -hmm. makes you look look more competitive. Uh, Mark, uh, yeah. So, so my experience is is uh, I guess kind of similar. My teaching load is uh, two classes per semester. So uh, I have uh, also. Um, 
because I'm at a, an institution where the class sizes are small. I don't have any TAs. So like I do everything for my classes, right? So uh, in terms of grading and, um, you know, answering student questions and stuff, that can be sometimes a big, a big load. Um, uh, I haven't, you know, been a faculty member at a research institution, but, you know, my PhD was at a, as a, a, a big institution and it's, um, you know, it's different in terms of like, say, resources and stuff too. You know, Chapman is uh, trying to raise its prominence in research, but there are, you know, a lot more uh, space in the university dedicated towards teaching, for example, than there are for for research. The more more teaching labs and research labs, I guess. Luna. So on that, my experience is very similar to all the panelists. Um, about a decade ago, I was teaching at a liberal arts university, Roger Williams in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So my teaching load was 4-4 actually, or 4-3, depends on semester. And coming to Purdue, currently I'm teaching 1-1. And also if I teach undergrad classes, I have a large TA support helping the grading and then doing the lab. And I think the primary reason, because your job responsibility is very different at a teaching school, you're focused on undergrad teaching. At research school, you're judging by a couple of things. So of course, teaching is very important. Don't, don't downplay that, right? And, and when we go to the promotion, we're definitely looking at your teaching evaluation, in particular for undergrad teaching, it's very, very important. And uh, but another thing that's important is your discovery, right? Your publication record, your funding record, and the, what's the impact of your research? Is that translated into the industry, and also the service, right? What are you done to the community? I mean, the professional community, and also this and the the community within the university. So I think uh, you're going to be judging by different criteria. Uh, on the other hand, you do have a a different support, as Mark pointed out, in the you know teaching university you have more labs on there. By research university you have a fantastic support on helping get your research lab going. You have pre award to help you develop a proposal, starting from the budget management, how you help develop your budget, and looking at the solicitation to see if your proposal fits all the criteria. And all the way to the post award to help you purchasing orders. So I have a business manager I meet on a monthly basis, some, sometimes two weekly basis, depends on how urgent that project. So they can really help you a lot on that, like managing your budget and help provide some support on travel. So it, it, it's a very different scale. And also I want to mention at the teaching institution, you do have very brilliant undergrad students. Like 10 years ago, I worked with undergrad students and we did have some publication. Of course, at research school, you have more matured, uh, you know, the grad students who come into, they already have master degree somewhere else, they're well-trained, you know, so it, it's, it's I, I would say it's a different expectation. So yeah, just to be aware of that. So I want to follow up on something Cecilia mentioned, um, which is kind of the skills you want to develop before you come into a teaching position. Um, so uh, I'll let Cecilia go first. Um, so what kind of skills did you develop uh, during your postdoc or during your PhD that really kind of helped launch your career and made that transition easier? Um, and what skills did you not develop that, that might have helped make that transition easier? Um, I think that as a graduate student and postdoc, uh, passed up an opportunity to work with others and to learn collaboratively and to just um, be a team player. And so I tried to learn as many different, um, you know, uh, methods and be open minded and just try to work with as many people. Um, and I think that kind of played to my advantage because I was familiar with many things and I was able to communicate with everybody with, you know, different disciplines um, a little bit, you know, as effectively as I could. Um, I think that when I was a poor positions, 
the fact that I had these different experiences and I was a postdoc, I did a postdoc at Caltech, I did a postdoc at USC um, and very different areas, different disciplines, but I felt like uh, I learned so much just in being open and flexible. And I think th those are the things that um, when you are applying, I'm sorry about the construction, if you hear construction. So if you are applying at positions at a large, you know, comprehensive teaching institution, I, I want to tell students or people out there, uh, postdocs out there, you know, these big places, um, they, they want research and they want teaching. So you really want to play up both and look as well-rounded as you can. And I know it's, it's hard, but if you, you know, guest lectured or if you had an opportunity to teach a course, please highlight that because at these teaching places, that's, that's what we want. But of course, t uh, research is always going to come first. Um, and then to answer Andrea's question, what do I wish I had done differently? Um, I think my panelists said it right that the, the resources at teaching universities are not like at a big research school. And so uh, probably what I wish I had done differently is develop the methods for my research quicker so that, you know, you can hit the ground running when you're at a teaching institution. You really, you really want to have a solid plan. Um, and not that I'm not saying mine wasn't solid, but, um, you know, you, you just assume you're going to have all these resources you have a, at a big research institution. And, and that's that's never the case. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Mark, I'll let you. Sure. So, um, I think there are a um, a few things in terms of for for me for preparation. So, um, I actually didn't have a lot of teaching experience before I applied. Right, I had done some guest lectures, but I had not. Um, I, when I was a grad student, I was never uh, a formal TA. Um, but in terms of preparation, I think the things that helped me were actually, especially at the teaching institution, having had worked with uh, undergrads when I was a grad student. So I had worked with and mentored undergrads and kind of um, overseen projects with them. And especially as that translates to now, uh, I mean, L Luna had mentioned doing research with undergrads. So I have a small team uh, of students I'm doing research with who are all undergrads, right? So I'm working with um, four students currently. And uh, the other thing that's kind of unique about Chapman is the engineering school is new. So none of these students are really studying uh, what my area of research is, which is probably kind of true for a lot of undergrads, right? Because we're working in uh, kind of more advanced areas often. So, uh, you know, learning how to translate that enthusiasm from the students who are uh, less prepared in terms of their the classes they've taken into productive research is um, is a, a skill, right? And I am still very much learning how to do that. But I feel like having had worked with undergrads before in research was helpful in kind of knowing ways that I could um, could try to get get things going. Um, let's see, what was am I missing? Part, part of the question, there was something that was. Um, what what, I... No, I, I, I think you, you got most of it. I was going to let okay. Luna answer because we were getting questions coming in. So I <laughs> want to make sure that we get to all of them. So oh, sure. Barney, I'm sure you're not going to get to. I'm sorry, you're not going to get to answer this one. Sorry. <laughs> sure. So what, what could I done differently at grad school? I think there are millions of things I would do differently, you know, um, so it's just a really, I think everybody have different journey, different experience. For me, it's different or unique in the sense that I started a very small liberal arts university. The College of Engineering have 12 faculty for the entire School of Engineering now at Purdue. You know, just at the School of Civil Engineering, we have approaching 70 faculty. So the sheer volume of the research is very different. And I, I learned in a very hard way. You know, I started... And um, it's just a very, very hard way. I made millions of mistakes. For instance, the first year when I was at UNC Charlotte, which is, I would say, our two institute, we're looking at research, we're looking at teaching. I was teaching at the 2-3 and 3-3 teaching load. I was going crazy of writing proposals. First year, I wrote 20 proposals. That was really big mistake, honestly. 
I would never do that again. I told all my grad students and the postdocs, I think it just that you're shooting, you know, everything in the dark. You don't even have a plan. Like Cecilia say, think about it. Use your postdoc, develop a solid research plan. What are you going to do? Once you get the job, you can just go right off, right? So there is a tons of mistake I could share. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm heading to Slido because their questions are coming in. Um, so uh, starting with the highest strength one. Um, oh, hold on, they're actively moving. Um, uh, how are job offers, so salary, other package conditions for teaching intensive jobs different from those of research intensive jobs? So I will let Barney handle this one and then Luna because you've gotten both. Uh, yeah, that's a good good question. And again, it's one of these things that's going to really vary from place to place. Um, you know, if you're at a big state school with a union and with pretty strict controls on what they can offer you, the your salary is going to be set, but you can negotiate a lot on your startup package. Um, at a private school, you're probably going to have more leverage than at a at a public teaching university. So again, it's it's one of these things that's really important to figure out as you proceed through the interviewing process to really find out what's important and how that can affect how you negotiate the, the position later on. Yeah, I think uh, to follow up with Bernie's, I think that that's correct. And private institution and the public are very different. So my first institution was a private institution. I think the salary was uh, was, was good. And, you know, the benefits was really good, very impressive for 3K and, you know, some other benefits. Um, I, I would like to compare with UNC Charlotte and the Purdue, all because they're both of public school, right? So they have a very similar mission, although one is R1, one is like R2 institution. So I think the salary, of course, Purdue is better than what I got paid there. In terms of the startup, it can can compare. You know, I, I think you cannot compare. Not that's just the way off the scale, the different scale in terms of the startup. Because I'm a primary experimental group, so we do nanomaterials, synthesize for energy harvesting and sensing, so we have a lot of equipment. Um, I think Purdue is very generous on that support, and also we typically get support of the grad students, right? So you have, it depends on your negotiation, right? You could get a couple of grad students and to start up. If you're lucky, you may get a postdoc for one year and something to help you set up lab. lab. So I think salary there is a scale don't bog down into negotiate salary right you, you can only move a little bit really try to get that startup piece going right that that can help you a lot mark and I, I know that chapman is new and there's a lot of different uh components to startups right now at chapman yeah so for um uh I didn't have much space to negotiate on salary, right? So uh, when I actually pushed on salary, I was offered um, a teaching release for uh, my first year. So um, I'm glad I tried to negotiate. Uh, in terms of startup, I think that my startup probably was not competitive with, you know, like a big R1 institution. Chapman is uh, recently reclassified to R2. Um, but there's also some trade-offs there. So um, we have less lab space. So my lab space is kind of partially shared, which is, you know, kind of a negative, but also I didn't have to worry about spending startup on renovating lab space, right? So I have kind of some space that was like, okay, this is what you have to use. And my money has been more focused on uh, equipment and, um, you know, students and things like that. Um, okay, so there's... Uh... There's one question I really wanted to make sure we got to. Uh, does working for tenure track exist at teaching universities? Uh, so Cecilia, why don't you kick us off on this one? It's gonna be sure. super short. <laughs> does work, ask me the questioning. Uh, for tenure track. So basically is tenure a thing at uh, oh, yes. teaching universities? Oh yes, it is. Oh yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm going to let everybody answer this, right? Because uh, Cecilia is at a public university, Mark is at a small private, you know, right? So you're all at different flavors of teaching institutions. So Cecilia, yes, at a public institution, Mark. 
Uh, yes, and I will also add, so we have uh, several, you know, non-tenure track, primarily teaching faculty. And at Chapman, there is a, um, you know, kind of a push towards making a primarily teaching faculty, like giving them some form of tenure or job security too. So depending on the institution, you may also find that even if it's not tenure track, if it's primarily teaching, there's at least pushes or like kind of more of a tenure like job security. Uh, Luna? Yes, I, the, yeah, the tenure track exists at every teaching university, right? I think it's private and the public both. Yeah, um, at Purdue we have a we have tenure track on primary teaching position, although they pay lower scale. Okay. Um, Barney. Uh, yeah, so there also are um, some of the big places do as as Luna said have tenure track for teaching positions. There also are um, science education, chemical education tracks where the, there's still research focus, but the research is in to education. Um, keep an eye on things because some places are trying to get rid of tenure. So there might be, you know, it's it's something to, to pay attention to in the future. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something to pay attention to, but I also think it's, it's one of those myths that's yeah. out there. Um, so I wanted to make sure we, we addressed it. Uh, what experience is required by primarily teaching institutions? So which CV components or qualifications would a strong candidate have? So uh, Cecilia kind of touched on this with, you know, making sure you highlight um, like any past teaching experience, but what, what other things would be important? Um, so Barney, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, so as for, a, for a primary undergraduate institution, um, in my experience, the biggest concern, the, one of the biggest things to, to get forth is that it's something that you understand what your role will be as a teacher and a researcher, uh, and it's not something that you're doing as a, you know, as, a as a second choice or as a safety net. That um, because you know this is these are liberal arts places are really special places, and um, they try to combine the education and the research and um, it's, it's really important to, to understand what's happening and, and to get that across to the, the committee. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, one thing you can do, as I mentioned before, is highlight your mentoring experience, but also know that even though you're applying at a teaching institution, they still want you to write grants, bring in money, um, and so you don't want to downplay that. If anything, that should be your strongest component. And it it typically is. As a postdoc, you're coming, you're coming off of a lab where you're doing cutting edge research, you're young, you're energetic, play that up, but also um, and, and make sure that you, if you do apply at a teaching institution, that you it's really like a really want to work with undergrads. So that needs to show. And I, I just want to um, congratulate the organizers for inviting Dr. Wirtz, who said, you know, he he showed that um, slide and that all the postdoc, um, you, you know, all the postdoc funding opportunities. And, and, and this is, so this is my example, right? If you were to operationalize your enthusiasm for working with with post with with undergrads, how would you show that? Right, it's it's by it's by doing things with undergrads, doing research, mentoring, etc. Uh, Mark, maybe you could also touch on the industry transition, right? Because obviously, in industry, you didn't teach. <laughs> right. So um, I think that uh, at Chapman, we've kind of we have uh, people who have kind of come from lots of different places, right? We have people who did like, you know, rock star postdocs who have come in and um, uh, also people who have come from industry, right? In terms of my application, I really try to emphasize um, how I continue to mentor even when I was in industry, right? So even when I was uh, doing uh working, you know, I, I had people working under me or people who I would work with and how I would try to, you know, teach them or uh, or be a good mentor to them, right? And kind of emphasize that the way I could. Uh, I, I agree with Cecilia that um, really important. Um, I think that, uh, or my impression, this may not be true, is that uh, having 
industry experience is uh, is generally a good sell or maybe a better sell at a teaching institution because you can say, I have work in industry and I can bring that experience to the students, right? Who most of my undergrad students are not going to go do research, right? They're going to go get a job somewhere and I can tell them what it's like to work in industry. I can bring, you know, funny stories and anecdotes to the classroom to kind of illustrate these points as I'm teaching them. So that's kind of my take on that. Um, one question. I just want to add, show, yeah, show please. Some enthusiasm. Um, that's what I, I think is, is key when you're applying at a teaching institution. It, it cannot be obvious that that is your second choice, right? If you're, you're waiting for the big RO, RO1 offer, it, it cannot be obvious uh, to when you interview. And, and I've been on enough interviewing and search committee support uh, to see that. And, and so my point, you know, my point in mentioning Dr. Wirtz, um opening talk was you can see how passionate and how much he cares about development for postdocs. You can see that in his talk. And that just exudes, you know, it exudes what he said. And you want to you want to show that passion for that place and for working with undergrads. Even if you have very little experience, you can talk about your own own experience and how doing undergrad research helped you. So I found the question I wanted to ask. Um, is the transition from a teaching intensive university to a research intensive university very difficult? Um, I've been told that research universities do not hire faculty from te teaching intensive universities. Is that true? Um, I think this is a great question because it gets to all the wide range of myths there are <laughs> about hiring. Um, so, uh, why don't we start with Mark? Because he also, he broke one of these myths about you can't go from industry to academia. And then we'll go to Luna, who went from teaching and also Barney. And I'm sorry, Cecilia, you kind of went the classic path. So, yeah. So we'll start with Mark. Yeah. So as I kind of previously mentioned at Chapman, at least, you know, we... Uh, we have, we're hiring a lot right now because the engineering school is growing and we are hiring people from all sorts of places. So uh, hiring people out of industry, hiring people who have just finished their PhD, hiring people who uh, are uh, coming from a postdoc, you know, that I think the common thread is everybody's enthusiastic about working with undergrads and um, they all bring a unique experience that we're looking for as we build our faculty. Well, to Perfect. I mean, to elaborate on Mark said, is that difficult? Yes. Is that impossible? No. I, you know, there is a, a numerous data points that has been showing the people moving from teaching institution to the research institution. And my department, including myself, we have four or five colleagues who were in the teaching institution and moved to the research institution. I think that really the trick is, you know, if, if you're so passionate about teaching, you love that discovery piece, just the don't, you know, just the continue pursuing your dream when you even at teaching institution, working with undergrad students, working with leverage any resources you could get, you know, for instance, I give you an example, when I was at UNC Charlotte, the department I was at engineering technology, we don't have a PhD program, but I talk with some other faculty, you know, at civil engineering, and then we could just co-advising the students if I get a grant, which um, your at teaching institution does not eliminate your ability to get NSF grants. Don't hear the other people tell you, you know, because you have three teaching, three plus t three teaching load, you should not write an NSF career. Um, you, you totally should, right? And that that's probably one thing you you should do. And if you get it, there may be a good leverage for you to move to the research institution. So you just have to believe yourself and ask, you know, what is important or what is the most awesome thing could happen for you in three, five years and put that down, right? And just stay focused, leverage the resources as you can 
And I think it's possible. It is difficult for sure, but it's definitely possible. I was, I was going to give Barney a chance if he wanted to chime uh, in. Yeah, I don't have much to add to what Luna said. Okay. It's, it's, it's tough, but it's it, it can be done. And there are lots of good examples um, if you look in your field and look around. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there to save time. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, would having a lot of experience in science outreach for school kids, so middle and high school, uh, help for teaching universities? So I'm guessing the question is kind of as as an alternative to maybe TAing or teaching a class. Um, so I'll let Mark and Cecilia handle this one. I wouldn't recommend it. I, I know a, a lot of people think they need to have a lot of teaching or adjunct experience. But but what I would recommend is is come in strong with your research. And um, because the expectation then is that you're going to learn to teach, you're going to be, you can be open to learning uh, new pedagogies, but your research is your own, you're the expert. And so uh, your research always has to be pri the primary thing, the strongest thing. Uh, just to add on to that, um, you know, a lot of these applications will have uh, some sort of a teaching statement. So even if you don't have a lot of experience, you can demonstrate like what, how you think about teaching in that statement to give some insight. Um, and I know also at Chapman, for example, we, as part of the interview process, this is in the before times, we had uh, all the faculty guest lecture a class with actual students. So, um, you, you know, there was an example, if someone really is going to be bad at teaching, right? They may kind of bomb that, right? But if you have, even if you haven't taught before, you can give like an hour long lecture on a topic, right? You know, you can demonstrate a baseline and, uh, you know, move forward. Now that that was part of the on-campus interview. So to, to get there, you can really uh, sell whatever experience you have in that teaching statement, right? You can draw connections to what you've done uh, and kind of make that mentorship or other things relevant towards towards teaching. So I think that's a, I, was, I wanted to follow up on Mark's point really quick about the on-campus teaching, um, because I would, that's a very different uh, component of the interview process for a teaching position than the on-campus chalk talk. Um, so maybe you could expand a little bit on what that on-campus teaching class is. So Mark, you can go first because you, you opened the door. Sure. So for me, uh, we scheduled the on-campus interviews and about a week before my uh, scheduled date, I was told, um, you know, this is the, the class you're teaching. It was human computer interaction or something. And here's the lecture you're going to give, which was uh, on um, ARM processors. Uh, so it was kind of a weird thing, but they, they also said, here's the professor if you have any questions. So I reached out and said, you know, what's the classroom situation like about how many students and kind of got some information, put something together. Um, uh, honestly, that, I was most nervous about that part of the of the interview because, you know, I can chat with people. I can talk I about my research I've done. Like that wasn't intimidating, but uh, I hadn't done a lot of teaching. So teaching actual students was intimidating, um, but it was it was an actual class. They introed me. The students knew what was going on, that I was applying for uh, a faculty position, and it was kind of like a tangential topical, you know, kind of tangential to the main class. And they, uh, before they left, they all had to do an anonymous online evaluation of me, of how they thought that I did. Um, and there was a couple of search, the professor for the class who was on the search committee and another professor, I think, sat in and uh, watched me give the guest lecture. So there was some non-student observation as well. I, I had the same experience. We'll give you a topic ahead of time. Usually it's about a week ahead of time and they will say, okay, you're going to lecture on this topic and you're going to be in front of a class. And it's usually, and it's also the hiring committee will be well, so it'll be your future colleagues who are evaluating you. Um, I think one of the some advice I can give you is um, make sure that you give examples that are relevant to the student population you will be teaching. 
So if you are applying to a place like California, you know, you can, if you can bring in the earthquakes or wildfires or something that we know we are from California, it just makes you look stronger because it looks like you really took the time to understand your environment and to be relevant to the students. The other thing, the other advice I can give you is, um, you know, pull out all the stops. If you can give out a handout, if you can use a video, you can, you know, as long as they're effective and as long as they show that you are thinking critically about reaching and engaging the students, um, I think you'll blow everyone away. I, I, um, we, we, you know, just to warn you, all of the candidates get the same topic. And so at our university, we hear the same lecture but about five times, right? It depends on how many people. <laughs> and so, it, so we hear the same, the same, the, you know, the same topic. So if you can make examples that are relevant, like I said, make it, um, you know, engaging for that student population, that can really make you stand out. Um, I, I wanted to give uh, Barney a chance to chime in. Uh, yeah. So none of the, it really depends again on where you apply. Like a lot of mm -hmm. mostly teaching places will will ask for these, um, but it, you know, I think what everyone has said has been is good. But keep in mind too that it's it's also a really weird kind of class preparation method because you've got no history with the class, no context outside of the one period you're in. So it's a it's a really strange kind of teaching that, and um, especially in places that are moving to more active learning and to other types of teaching modalities. It, it, it's important too to think about how to try to adjust to to maybe not just give a straight lecture for an hour and make it more fun for everybody. Um, so moving on to the next question, um, are academic job descriptions set in stone? Um, if I see a listing, that's purely teaching, but I'm also interested in running student support programs or vice versa. Is that something that's negotiable? Um, so, Luna, why don't you start us with this one? I'm not very clear about this question. <laughs> so, okay. it means if you're interested in teaching and can you do research? Can, uh, can so, you like Luna? academic support programs. Um, so, I'm guessing they mean uh, something like um, maybe an outreach program or maybe something like uh, running at least at USC, this would be described as like running the honors thesis program. Um, so not, not just teaching, um, but still doing student focused things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely valued, right? That's definitely valued for the tenure process at any institution, teaching institution, research institution, anything you can help the students and community definitely will be value. But one thing I want to emphasize, that's not the cake, that's icing on the cake. So the, the, the core is really your teaching and your research ability, right? Once you have more capacity and adds on, you know, not jumping in the job first year, you do a lot of outreach. You know, maybe you're just this superman or superwoman, you could do everything just to go for it. But I, you know, if, if you're, try to strive for success and put that in the plan. Um, Mark? Sure, so uh, I think that this probably varies from institution to institution. So um, because the engineering department at Chapman is new, like our hiring is pretty broad right now. We're like hiring electrical engineering, computer engineering, computer science, but like those fields are very broad, right? It's not like we're looking for a roboticist in electrical engineering. It's like, you know, if you're doing anything and you're interested in being, you know, a part of this, then apply. Um, so that also applies to, in terms of like outreach. So I've been kind of, <laughs> as Luna was saying, you focus on your teaching and research. And I've been given this advice of, you know, service doesn't get you tenure, right? So just do whatever service you need to do. But because my department is small, we all have a fairly significant service, right? We're all, we're all doing the service that we're like, you know, not that I don't have a choice, but like, I don't have a choice, right? So I think that you, you can find avenues uh, 
where you are right to do these things, but I do think it is something that you would mostly grow into, right? So you can get the job and then see what what opportunities are available, and that will vary from institution to institution. Agree more. I think if they hire you, they see things in you that maybe you don't see in yourself and they see, oh, this person has the potential to work with this group or this person can collaborate here. And they see much more in, in terms of service and in terms of this contributing than you may even see. Um, so, so absolutely. Um, I think the sky's the limit when you get hired, but, but as Luna mentioned, I just want to echo, get your research done first, get, get that established, and then you can branch out and apply for these big grants and uh, big collaborate, collaborative grants. Um, so we're going <clears> to <throat> handle two last questions. Um, the the first one, I think everybody should comment on. Um, so I have some teaching experience, and some of them I consider myself successful, but with others I'm not satisfied. As a fresh teacher, I would like to hear some feelings from experienced teachers and how they handle that. Um, so I think Mark is the newest teacher, so we're going to start with him. So, uh, you know, there, the my first semester, there were some students who I just could not get through to, right? No matter how much I explained the topic, I just could not get to them. And uh, one of my colleagues reminded me that I'm a, I'm teaching the whole class, right? I'm not, which means I'm trying to teach every individual student, but you, there's only so much you can do, right? So you, uh, you have to live with that disappointment. The other thing is uh, teaching a lot. You have like good days and bad days. My first semester, I taught the same class, but back to back. My second lecture was always better than my first, right? And uh, I always felt bad about that because my first class like was kind of the guinea pigs. They were almost like the practice <laughs> lecture. I had knocked it out of the park with my second lecture because I had just run through it once, right? Um, so these it's just something that I think you have to manage. I think that especially in a new faculty position, there's so much going on, right? Teaching takes a ton of time. You try and get your research off the ground. That's a ton of time. You have to try to balance these things. And I think with the pandemic, it's even been, you know, more of that, right? Uh, as we're all kind of trying to navigate how to deal with these things in this completely new context. Um, and so part of that is kind of managing that you're, you just bring the best you can and you're never, and sometimes, you know, you, you don't quite get there and you just learn your lessons and you do better next time. Um, Cecilia? Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think teaching is hard. <laughs> it, <laughs> I think if you care, you're never, it's never gonna be perfect. Um, but if you can do some reflection and go back and look at, um, you know, your own lecture style and just keep improving every time, you can get there. I mean, I have a colleague who's been teaching 30 years and he says, now after 30 years, I have the best lectures, you know, because <laughs> I, I think I think because you have engaging and it's becoming harder and harder to engage our students, especially you know, in this new virtual setting. And, and so you really, you really want to do your best and maybe not be so hard on yourself. Your students uh, see something in you that, that you may not see. You, you are relatable to them and they look up to you and, and definitely, you, you know, use that, use that. Um, and, and I, I think um, anywhere where you, anytime you can include, for example, assessment or assessment activities, um, if you are thinking about um, applying to a teaching institution, putting that in your in your teaching plan, you know, maybe that you did outreach, but then you also did the component of assessing. Was the outreach effective? What was the the after effects of what you did, that's that's where maybe you you could highlight these things to. Uh... I guess I could also add that um, a bit of advice that I think applies to just about every aspect of getting started out as a new professor is, is to try to find 
senior colleagues and mentors and people who've been through it before, who you trust, who will give you honest advice about how to do things better or if you have problems with things. When I was starting at, at Dartmouth, I found a couple of older colleagues who had, we had nothing in common in terms of research interests, but um, I ended up spending way more time talking to them about teaching and they told me old stories about when they had bad days teaching or students who they had trouble with and it was uh, it, it helped out quite a bit and then and that goes for you know trying to figure out who to talk to about where to order stuff try to figure out who to talk to about putting grants in every aspect of the job i think it's, it's good to find people who can help whether they're at your university which is hopefully true or if not in other places um luna I, I think, you know, all the panelists that has touched upon a very important aspect, right? You just have to be very creative and particularly nowadays with pandemic and think about what is the best methods to reach out to the students. You know, it's important that you have that passion, enthusiastic and the care for them, right? You care their feedback, you care if they learn or not. Uh, what Cecilia pointed out, have a, uh, you know, assessment is very important, right? Don't wait until end of the semester, the university hand out that official one. You can do uh, a quiz in, the, in, you know, in the middle of the semester, get some early feedback. And sometimes you have one perception. It may not be the student's perception. There is mismatch, right? And make sure you align their, you know, their expectation, what they think a great professor should be. It, it could be totally different than what you think, right? And just to also look at long term. The teaching can give you immediate feedback, right? If you have a great class, you just feel wonderful about yourself. And sometimes you stumble, you feel like, oh, what I what I just say. But you know, those are the minor things. Just don't bog down in that details, right? Let, let's look at the long-term plan and, and really try to align your teaching um, pedagogy with the students. Because I, I started my academic career about a decade ago. I find the students are very different nowadays with, you know, 10 years ago, I just started being a fresh assistant professor, right? So it, it's changing. We, we just have to be creative. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Um, so I want to give everybody an opportunity. So I guess the last question to give everyone an opportunity um, to give uh, all of the students and postdocs out there uh, kind of one piece of advice. Um, this could be if they're applying for a, a teaching position, if they're trying to make a decision between a research institution or a teaching institution at a PUI. Um, so it's up to you. Um, I'm going to, you know, nobody wants to go first. Uh, Barney, you, you drew the short straw. Um, so you get to go first. Okay. Uh, my advice, my thought would be to, you know, think about where you've been, think about what you're doing, and then think about if you want to be doing the same thing, something slightly different in five years and 10 years and kind of use that to help help guide your decision. And again, here, knowing older people in your area, in your field, and being able to talk to them and ask them about their paths, I think would also help quite a bit in, in helping guide your decision. So again, finding people you trust to, to give you enough bits of information to figure out how you want to do it. And then after that, be persistent, but be patient and realize that a lot of people are trying to help you and a lot of it comes down to luck and circumstance and other things that that you can't always affect so just do what you can so does anyone want to volunteer to go next or i'll volunteer you oh i can i okay. sure my experience is you know i made the tons of mistakes but i think one thing i have done right which seems worked out is have a plan, right? And know where you want to go um, and find a mentor. That mentor cannot be just the one, right? The mentor can help you in one specific question, like Bernie said, research, you can have a research mentor, you can have a teaching mentor. You know, for instance, Andrea has played a mentor on my, you know, career development. When I moved to Purdue and I never run a large lab, I've never run a large research group. And, you know, to the point I have 10 people in my group, I'm overwhelmed. I said, who I should ask, right? I thought about Andrea. She's so successful running a group. And, and then, so Andrea actually shared with me her 
lab culture. And she had this handbook for her postdoc grad students, which I, I, I took a part of it, uh, you know, with her permission. And it ran in my lab has been success, successful. I think I started building a good culture. And and so far, it really running smoothly. I appreciate it for that. And so get a mentor, right? You have think about what is the problem and who can help you solve that problem, who have been successful in that. Reach out. You know, you'll be surprised how many people are willing to help. I only met Andrea once 10 years ago or eight years ago. I don't know, right? So, but I reached out to her. She was just wonderfully helped me. And I think the third point I, I think I worked out for me is develop a strategy and follow through, like Bernie said, right? Have a st strategy, be persistent, and follow through. It really is everyday matters, right? Don't obsess with your four years plan, right? It's that's the, that's the road sign, but ultimately, which get you out in is this grinding process every single day is what you're doing. That that's important. So follow through. It's very very important. Cecilia, Mark. Sure. I echo with what everyone said. I I would I I think know your environment, know where you're applying. You know, some universities uh, send mixed messages. If you're applying at a teaching institution, you might apply, and the department is all about teaching, but the dean might have this greater vision about research, and so you really want to make sure you hit both very well. And the teaching statement is not trivial take it seriously. And now universities are asking for a diversity statement. Some of the UCs have noticed are doing that too. Take those things very seriously. Do, do, not, do not take them lightly. Um, I've heard, for example, at UC Merced, the first thing they look at is that diversity statement. So you, you really want to make sure you take those ser seriously. Uh Everybody's given great advice, so thanks for making it tough for me. Um, <laughs> but so I'll say, even if you're considering uh, like a primary, primarily research versus primarily teaching, there's really more of a spectrum, right? So you might find a primarily teaching university that really wants to emphasize research, right? You might find a uh, a primarily research university that's really proud of their teaching. You also might find a research university where they don't care about teaching so much, right? So I think you will find variation and, and trying to find what you want. You can um, hopefully try to find a place where it kind of hits your blend of what you're looking for, right? Uh, at a teaching university, you you will be able to do research, right? I do research. It just it looks a little different. You know, I'm working with undergrads. Uh, I have less space, but I'm still trying to do meaningful, impactful research. Um, so the other thing I'll say with that is I think that as you apply, those kind of uh, differences are maybe not as apparent in the application, right? So that's something that if you get invited to an on-campus, you can try to find out uh, what what is the the blend at this place that I've applied to that I'm trying to to figure out? Perfect. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up the session. Uh, we have a a small break uh, for about 25 minutes, so I hope to see everybody back at uh, 9:55 Pacific time. Um, so 25 minutes from now. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you to our wonderful panelists. I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Andrea. It was nice to meet everyone. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you, Andrea.